Welcome back to the MOOC course titled Qualitative Research Methods. My name is Aradhana Malik and I am helping you with this course. So, in the previous lecture we discussed what qualitative inquiry was. I introduced you to some strategies of qualitative inquiry. In this particular lecture, we are now going to move into what you know the, the qualitative research design. So, I introduced you to a little bit of qualitative research design and we will discuss that in detail in this particular lecture and the next lecture also. So, let us move on with this. Okay. <coughs> qualitative research design as choreography. So, this again is based on a paper by uh, Jansik, I, I hope I am or Janzik, I hope I am pronouncing the name right, I am sorry if I am not. Hmm. But this is from this book called Handbook of Qualitative Research, second edition. Thank you. So, this is the book I am referring to and of course, I will give you a proper reference for it in the notes that I give you. Okay. Qualitative research design is choreography and uh, I am going to refer to her as Janzik. I hope I am pronouncing her last name right. So, Janzik is you know she is mentioned in the in the paper that she is also a dancer and she has drawn an analogy with the you know she is uh, of uh, an analogy between qualitative research design and choreography and it is really beautiful for somebody who appreciates what qualitative research is and how it is conducted and, and so I have taken that from this paper and tried to share that with you. She says that qualitative researchers and choreographers are very similar to each other and they are similar in the following ways. One, they situate and recontextualize the research project within the shared experience of the researcher and participants in the study or connected to dance. She says that it is the same as the person, the choreographer and the dancers and they create something together, they situate the dance forms within the dance, within the shared experience they have in interacting with each other. So, the same thing happens with qualitative research. The qualitative researcher situates the research project within the shared experience. They take the shared experience, take that as a context and situate the project within that context and then recontextualize the project because once they become a part of the context, the context, the shape, the flavor of the context changes just by virtue of the researcher being a part of it. So, recontextualization takes place and it is accepted that this change is going to happen and that is you know that then adds to the flavor of the research. Next, they refuse to separate art and Dewey in this article says that art is providing a sense of the whole of something, you know it is a representation of whole of something. So, they refuse to separate art from ordinary experience. Ordinary experience may be a part of something, but then they look at ordinary experience as a representation of a much larger, much more beautiful, much more flavorful, much more complex whole. They also refuse to be limited to just one approach or one technique from history by using various techniques and rigorous and tested procedures in working to capture the nuance and complexity of the social situation under study. Very complicated sentence does not it mean something very simple. They, they do not want to use just one approach. So, both researchers, qualitative researchers and choreographers take whatever they can from history, but also strive to develop newer techniques by having you know after having a thorough and rigorous knowledge and practicing those uh, of, of traditionally uh, used techniques and then practicing these techniques they develop some newer techniques that are more relevant to the situation that they are studying. So, rigorous training is required in order to become a, a qualitative researcher. Hmm. And so, they use the rigorous 
tried and tested procedures to develop something new in order to capture the nuances and the complexities of the social situation under study. So, they do not stop at one technique, they do whatever it takes, but in order to do that they need to be informed about it, they need to study about these things and I am going to reinforce this for the benefit of the students who are listening to this lecture. There is no substitute to reading, to studying, to digging into literature as far as especially as far as your role as a researcher is concerned. There is there are no shortcuts and there is no substitute. One has to be prepared for that kind of rigorous hard work and then only can one aim to become somebody who can actually find something new. Okay. Beginning explicitly or implicitly with the question what do I want to know in the study? or in the case of dance, what is the message I want to send out through this dance. So, that is the similarity that Janzik has drawn between choreography and qualitative research. Again the last thing points, the last point indicates the importance of the research question. What is it that I am trying to find out? That is something that needs to be clear in your mind write it again I am, I am insisting that you write it down, you stick it on your wall, you make it your screen saver, you put it on your cell phone, you do whatever it takes to make sure that you are anchored to it every time you are tempted to stray away from it and go into a newer direction because a timeline has to be there. So, use it as your anchor, use it as something that pulls you back to your ultimate goal. Okay. Stages of qualitative research design, Janzik says that there are three main stages. The first stage according to her is the warm up stage. So, we get ready to actually do the work. Hmm. So, it is like you know as far as dance is concerned you jog, you stretch yourself, you, you stretch your limbs, you loosen your muscles when you are doing your exercise you go, you jog, you, you know breathe in fresh air, you do some stretching and relaxing exercises and then you prepare for the hard work that is to come. Similarly, in qualitative research design, there is a warm up period, there is a preparation period or a pre choreographic stage of design decisions right in the beginning of the study. Then once you have warmed up, you know what you are getting into, you know what is required, then you actually start and do it, exploration or try out or and total workout stage when design, uh, design decisions are made throughout the study. So, you actually go find out you know you have a trying stage, you have a, a stretching stage and then you explore. You start finding out what will work and what will not go do whatever is needed to be done and then you pull out. The third stage is illumination and formulation or the completion stage when design decisions are made at the end or near the end of the study. So, decisions are going to be made throughout the study as you move into the study. So, you have a pre-design uh, stage or, or actually the sorry the preparation stage where you are making your decisions based on the knowledge you have after having read whatever it was whatever was required to be read after your conversations with your supervisors or other seniors in the field or your experience with similar situations in the past. So, this is rooted in historical information. The second stage is rooted in current information. What have I got in my hand today? What can I do today? The third stage is rooted in the second stage. What did I learn currently? in relation to what and how does it relate to what I had learnt before I even started on this. You bring these two together, you wrap up and then you finally get ready to approaching your study. Okay. Stage 1 warm up and preparation and this stage is characterized by A the questions that guide the study, again research question. The research question is by far the most important aspect of your research study. If that question is not clear in your mind, you 
just cannot proceed. You can collect whatever data you want to collect. It will only make sense in light of the question you are going to ask or the question you are attempting to ask. And that question is informed by the literature that you go through, by your discussions with others in the field, by your own understanding of the field. So, once that question is clear, crystal clear in your mind and is articulated as clearly as possible and is remembered at every second, every moment in time by you, that is when you should move into the other stages. Okay. Question, selection of a site and participants. Once you know what you are going to find out, what you are trying to find out, then you go in and you try and you find out who you will speak to and where or who you will observe and where, what are you going to do. Hmm? Then access and entry to the site and agreements with the participants, again nuts and bolts. So, our aim is not to disturb the current situation of the participants, it is just to go and find out what is going on. Hmm? Many times this is especially true for studies that involve some kind of a disturbance, some kind of a an entry into the vulnerable sides of the participants, into the vulnerable comfort zones of the participants. So, for example, you want to study about say uh, hmm, child abuse. I am taking a very, very strong, very difficult aspect. You want to study about child abuse. Now, a, per, a child who has been abused will one will not be in the condition to talk to you, will not be in a state to talk to you when just after the abuse has taken place. The child's family will also not be ready to speak to you after this, just after this has taken place. So, some cooling off period is required or you maybe want to speak to victims of child abuse later on. Now, they have already gone through this experience, their wounds have already healed, there are scar tissues, I am talking in medical terms now. When you ask people when you ask these children to revisit what happened at that time, you are actually disturbing that scar tissue. Some of them may have forgotten about the incident, deliberately pushed it into, into that area of their mind where they do not want to remember it. Some of them may still be dealing with it, but they may not want to talk about it. For others, it may be a mode of catharsis, just talking to you about it. It may give them a chance to vent their already pent up feelings. One does not know. But if it is somebody who is in the healing process and you go and disturb them, then it can, it can really affect them very badly because the healing has to start again. Just imagine a, a wound on your skin. So, you get hurt and then a scab is formed and when you try and find out how the person got hurt and you want to find out what is under that scab, you actually break open the scab. You know, this is similar to the work of doctors and I am sorry, I do not mean to hurt the feelings of our very good doctors, but whenever you go to the doctor and you say, oh, my hand is hurting, what does the doctor do? They will say, they will poke you where it hurts the most and they will say, oh, is this where it hurts the most and you scream in pain and you say, why did you hurt me more? They just want to know where it hurts. So, that is exactly what you are doing when you are interacting with the participants, especially about vulnerable situations. And so, you agree, you gain an entry into the site, you establish agreements with the participants and you know we, we have, uh, I studied in the United States and my research project went through the institutional review board uh, constituted by my university. So, you know I am aware of what all can go, can one needs to be careful of when dealing with uh, with human subjects. So, you actually have a review uh, board uh, to look into the protection of human subjects who are being studied. So, participants need to be informed about what is going to be studied, how this is likely to affect their current situation and they have to agree to participating in the study despite these supposed problems. So, you establish an agreement with the participants. Then timeline for the study, how much time are you going to take. Then selection of appropriate research strategies, how are you going to conduct the research. The methods, yes, but how are you going to use these methods 
you know, to what extent, which method will be used along with which other method, how will triangulation and crystallization take place, we will discuss these things later. Then the place of theory in the study, how will past work, past theories, past uh, established ideals and beliefs fit in with what you are doing currently? Identification of the researcher's own beliefs and ideology. So, where do you, you fit in? We assume that the researcher's personal bias will find a place in the study, will affect the study, will change the flavor of the study. So, where will you know what will happen there? So, you have to identify these things and you have to accept them. Then, identification of appropriate informed consent procedures and willingness to deal with ethical issues as they present themselves. Many times despite our best efforts, we tend to disturb the status quo, we tend to end, we, we, we end up hurting participants even when we do not want to, we do not intend to. So, you know sometimes ethical issues will come up, we end up hurting stakeholders who we never knew existed and this is you know we, we can only do so much, many times there are still things that we, we are not able to do and one should be prepared to face these ethical issues and informed consent forms are very, very essential and I must stress that there is no standard format for an informed consent form. The first thing that should go into the informed consent form is the way I understand it is one, the tentative topic of your study and two, your research objectives, three, uh, sorry, two, your research question, three, your research objectives. What are you studying? Why are you studying? How are you going to study it? What is the role of the participants? How is, how are they going to fit in? to whatever you are going to study, why do you need to speak to them, why should they spend any time speaking to you, why should they give you any information about themselves, they need to know about all of this and only then should they put their signature at the bottom saying that yes, they have, ex they have understood everything that you are asking of them. Okay. And then you collect that and that helps you save yourself and that also helps you be more ethical and more sensitive to the needs of the people you are studying. So, it is a win-win situation for both. Okay. Assumptions in qualitative research design, qualitative research design is ideologically driven, it is rooted in theory, it is rooted in what has happened in the past and it is driven by ideology. Researcher bias, the second point here is that we assume that researcher bias will creep into qualitative research design simply because the researcher has to be connected to a large extent, to a very great extent with the phenomenon, the context that one is studying. You need to be totally immersed in that context, even as a non-participant observer, unless we understand the flavor of the context, we cannot really understand what is going on. So, our biases, our belief systems, our values, our ideals will in turn feed into how we filter out whatever we are receiving. We cannot, after all, we are not, you know. 360 degree receivers of information for want, for lack of a better, more appropriate phrase. We cannot absorb everything we experience. At every given point of time, we are consciously or subconsciously filtering out information that we think is not going to be required. And this filtering process is influenced by our own belief systems, by our own biases. So, qualitative researchers lay out these biases in black and white. Hmm. Whatever their biases may be, whatever their belief systems may be. I firmly believe, I will give you an example, I firmly believe that human behavior cannot be totally fully quantified. I have had a discussion with some of my seniors about it and they said, how do you know? You know, if we restricted ourselves, maybe I do not know, but today if based on whatever I know that is a bias I have. So, if anyone says yes, I can fully predict human behavior based on material collected through and analyzed through quantitative methods, I say I 
I am not sure I would I would take that information with a pinch of salt and I would want to know what is left out in the gray areas. So, I personally would not want to believe it a hundred I will probably believe it up to a point and then I will say what about things that have not been or what about aspects of this study that have not been quantified. You know how have you studied those how have you approached those. So, even if something is fully quantified I think my personal belief would prevent me my experiences with research and with human beings and their behavior would somehow pose a barrier between my understanding of complete 100 percent quantification of human behavior and prediction based on a 100 percent absolute quantification of a particular behavior. I am not talking about physiology behavior of human beings. So, that would interfere with it. So, that is what one needs to lay out on the table in black and white. Okay. Characteristics of qualitative research design, qualitative research design is holistic. Qualitative research is not constructed to prove something or to control people. So, these are some of the characteristics it looks at the larger whole it does not really try to prove or disprove something or it does not even try to control people in order to find out what is going on. Qualitative design looks at relationships within systems or cultures. So, the relationship between systems cultures is explored through qualitative design. Qualitative design is concerned with the personal face to face and immediate reality is what we are talking about here. We are talking about how things happen not how they are supposed to happen. We do not start with with again you know when we say we are not out to prove or disprove we do not start with the notion of this is supposed to happen like this what is the delta what is the difference between how it is supposed to happen and how it is happening no. We study things as they are happening and then we try and make sense out of them okay. and it is real face to face immediate personal one on one. Hmm. It is not force focused on understanding given social settings not necessarily making it is focused on understanding given social settings not necessarily making predictions about those things. Prediction is an accidental byproduct if it happens great, but we do not go in with the notion of being able to predict something based on qualitative research methods. Qualitative research methods help us identify how much we can do or uh, sorry they help us identify what is out there. They help us identify what is really happening between the lines that are not covered by quantification. Okay. Qualitative design demands that the researcher stay in the setting over time. So, qualitative design mandates the researcher to be a part of the research setting over a period of time in order to, to imbibe the flavor of the setting. So, the researcher can make as complete sense of the setting as possible. So, the researcher can absorb everything that the setting is giving her or him. Qualitative design demands time in analysis equal to the time in the field. Qualitative design also requires that analysis take you know the analysis be conducted as thoroughly as possible. So, if you have spent some time collecting data then this has been studied similar amount of time is required to analyze the data because there is so much of it. Qualitative design sometimes requires that the researcher develop a model of what occurred in the social setting sometimes. Qualitative design requires the researcher to become the research instrument you are not only an objective observer we talked about this earlier on in some of the earlier lectures you are not a disinterested observer you are somebody who is observing things from outside you are also doing the research and in doing the research you become a part of the or conducting the research you are using certain strategies you become a part of the you become an instrument of research. Because two qualitative researchers using the same qualitative research instrument 
are bound to come up with different not bound, but are likely to come up with very different results. So, your association with the strategy that you are using is of critical value in understanding how the output will shape up. Okay. And unless you form a relationship with the design that you are uh, or sorry with the strategy that you are using, your uh, you know the output cannot be very rich. Okay. Qualitative design incorporates informed consent decisions and is responsible to ethical concerns. Needless to say, we are observing real situations, real people, real phenomena and we need to have the informed consent part needs to be a, I mean we know we need to be very, very sensitive to, very careful about, very, very uh, in tune with the uh, with whatever we are studying and we, we need to be concerned about how it is going to affect the situation that we are a part of. Qualitative design incorporates room for description of the role of the researcher as well as description of the researcher's own biases and ideological preference. Hmm. So, qualitative design has room is able to accommodate description of the role of the researcher as well as description of the researcher's bias and ideological preference because it is influencing the output. So, we need to accommodate these things. Qualitative design requires the construction of an authentic and compelling narrative uh, sorry of what occurred in the study. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So, of what occurred in the study and the various stories of the participants. Qualitative research design requires the or requires the researcher to write a narrative of what happened in the study and the stories, the details regarding how the participants experienced what was being done with them. Qualitative research requires ongoing analysis of the data. It is not a one time analysis, it is analysis reflection, analysis reflection, analysis reflection that whole back and forth game continues and that is what qualitative research design requires the researcher to do. Now, that is all we have time for. I had planned to include a couple more things in this, but that is all we have time for in this lecture. We will continue with this discussion in the upcoming lectures. Thank you very much for listening.